All right, welcome. Um, I'm really excited about this. First of all, it's exciting to meet a new batch of wonderful students. It's always really, really exciting. We we're really happy to have you here and hopefully you're excited. Um, this is your kind of your first taste of USD and your first taste of college. <clears throat> and it's it really is an innovative thing we're doing here. It's it's rather new. This is only the, I think the third year we're doing this. And we've started doing this initially, we started doing it because of course the pandemic pushed us online, but then we realized the real value of getting to know some of you ahead of time and giving you a chance to get to know some of us and to, to get a sense of what college is all about. But there's another reason we do this and it, it's because it allows us to have some really interesting conversations about some very important topics. And ours, of course, is about speaking truth to power. What does that mean? That means when you're facing the kinds of urgent challenges we're facing now, we have to be ready to speak up. We have to be ready to, to play a role in trying to confront these challenges. And we have all kinds of challenges. I'm sure you're well aware. It's been a turbulent few years. We have all kinds of injustices happening here in the United States, right here in California and San Diego, also around the world. We, you know, we could name them and the list would go on and on. We have big, big global level challenges like climate change, right? And right now we're in the midst of a heat wave all over the place. I mean, when you say we, it, you could really be talking about many places around the globe at this moment are facing sort of unprecedented um, heat and drought. We're in a drought in California, a pretty deep one. We're, in, we're in facing a lot there. And of course, lots of economic inequality. Um, we see that right now. The economy is working overtime to help the few who are already doing quite well. And it's putting a lot of people who are not doing so well in severe risk. So we, we designed this course to, to talk about the different ways that we can use our voices, use our, our careers, our life's work, use our uh, social connections to try to, to meet these challenges and to, to build a better future. But as I said, this is also a chance for you to get a taste of college, a taste of USD. You're going to be introduced to a broad range of academic disciplines, different perspectives on similar questions. So as we talk about speaking truth to power, you'll see that from the lens of different departments, different majors, different academic disciplines, different fields of study. This is interesting for you both because you might be thinking, hey, what do I want to major in or what minors do I want to have? But also because you'll see the value, even if it isn't your major, of these differing perspectives. And you'll come to understand how they can um, really add value to the work that you go on to do. You'll also meet lots of interesting perspectives professors from across these disciplines. In all, you'll meet 20 different professors, not including the two of us who are coordinating this, so 22 professors in all. And that's a chance for you to get a sense of professors you'd like to work with, professors you'd know, like to do research for, with, professors you'd like to take more classes from. So really soak this in and, and use it to your advantage as you make decisions throughout college. Um, you also, and maybe most importantly, get a sense of the kind of critical thinking and writing that we do at the college level. It's going to be different for most of you, quite different from what you've done before. And this will be your first opportunity to see that we're going beyond just learning, you know, what. We're starting to ask deeper questions about how and why, and under what circumstances, and critically taking apart the various issues that we're going to discuss and finding ways to understand them more deeply, and in some cases to act on them. So this is, a, is an opportunity for you to get a head start on that, sure. the ground running as you, as you start in September with that critical thinking that all of your classes will demand of you. It's not going to be enough to simply do the reading anymore. I don't, and maybe it wasn't in high school, hopefully, but it certainly won't be now. You really need to engage and come to class prepared to jump in. And so this is your first opportunity to think about that, especially in the discussion sections um, where you'll have a real chance to break out into smaller groups and have some time um, with a professor really delving into the topics we're discussing. The final thing I wanna stress is that this should expose you to the importance of interdisciplinarity. 
that's a word you'll hear a lot about at, at USD, that and the liberal arts. That means trying to look at the world through a variety of lenses. You pick a major, maybe you'll have more than one major. And that's okay that you wanna focus on one lens, but it's really important that you see the value of bringing in these other perspectives, these other ways of looking at problems because you're only looking at one small facet of a problem if you're using one lens. In a, you know, in a way of thinking, you're sort of myopic. You know, you're not seeing clearly the other parts of the problem. And so this course is designed to, to expose you to the idea that it's all the better, all the richer, all the more um, suitable to see the complexity of the world if you have a complex set of paradigms, complex set of perspectives to use. And so we're going to show you the various professors, the different ways of looking at and taking apart and engaging with problems through these different lenses. It gives you a more complete understanding of the world and the, the various problems that we're trying to solve. And it might expose you to the real risk of choosing a single lens. Probably you've already seen when somebody is myopic to the rest of the world, when they are only looking from their own narrow perspective, they're missing something and it's a risk. They may act in a way that is really missing some of the broader context of the problem. Part, one of the biggest parts of our mission at the University of San Diego is to prepare you to meet a complex world with complex thinking with compassion, with an understanding for varying perspectives. And so we're gonna to try to start that work here this summer and hopefully it'll carry right through to September. Now, logistically, there are a couple of things I wanna mention. Um, and I, I see in the chat, some people say, I can't hear you. Um, unless, unless I've been talking and no one else can hear me, I suspect that's on your end. And so you'll probably need to deal if there's, are there any of those technical questions we're happy to try to help you, but a lot of that is going to be on your end. So you might want to check your settings out, make sure that you've um, enabled your speakers and your microphone and so on. Great, other people say they can hear me. So that's good news because I'll lose my voice if I have to go through that again. Um, I think my, my, voice is, my voice box is out of, uh, out of, hasn't been trained enough. Uh, you know, during the summer, I, I've lost my, uh, my speaking stamina. So I'm already going here. So the, I just wanna go through a couple of the um, logistical issues. The first one is, of course, we're meeting here on Mondays at this time every week for the next five weeks, but you also have section meetings. We're actually working on updating the um, Calendly link. It should be okay. I know some of you may have already gone there and we're gonna ask you to go back because there was a, a technical error and we included sections that don't exist. So if you have already signed up, you may get a cancellation. If you have not signed up, and this is the most important logistical thing, you have to be able to log into Blackboard. If there's anyone who can't log into Blackboard, please send an email right away. I'm going to, you should have our, my email address and Dr. Smith's email address, but I'm gonna drop it in the chat here anyhow. Um, so everyone has it here and I'll say it out loud for, for those of you who can't see the chat. It's A-T-I-R-R-E-L-L -L at San Diego. Edu. That's all of our addresses at USD or at San Diego.edu. If you um, have any problems getting into Blackboard, let us know immediately because that's where, I mean, hopefully that's where you already found the link to this. That's also where your readings and your assignments will be. And that's also where you'll see on the left side, the section sign. -up. You have to sign up for one section every week. And that's where you'll meet with a, it, with a professor in a smaller group to, um, to, to do some in-depth discussion of the topics. Um, so that's very important. It really, it's as, as important as this meeting and in some ways more important because that's where you're really going to dive in. Um, but both meetings, this Monday meeting and one section meeting are mandatory every week to get credit for this class. So please sign up. Like I said, if you signed up already and received a cancellation, please go back and sign up again. There was just a technical glitch. Um, those meetings are also going to be way more like a standard USD course in that what we're doing here is special, but we don't usually meet in such a large group. Right now, of course, we have like 100 people meeting, but USD classes are much smaller than that, usually around 30 at most, sometimes maybe 35 at a maximum. 
And so those section meetings will be much, much, much more similar to what you can expect at USD. In fact, many classes are closer to 20 folks, um, especially as you get to the upper division levels and you're working on um, senior research or, or um, capstone projects, you'll get to be in very small classes. So um, it's important that you go to those section meetings, but not just attend. It's important that you go with some ideas, something you'd like to talk about, a question you'd like to ask. Uh, it doesn't have to be um, that you come prepared to, uh, you know, uh, have a million questions. There's not, it's not meant to be high pressure, but come with something that you want to learn more about and some way that you want to, to engage in the conversation. That's good practice because that's what will be expected when you start in September. So go to the Blackboard page, sign up for those sections, make sure you can access the readings and in some cases, some videos to watch before each meeting every week um, and make sure that you can access the assignments that will be due each week. Um, if there are any questions about this, um, certainly feel free to reach out by email. You can also ask some questions um, when you meet with your sections, but some of the logistical questions really need to come to, to me, A-T-I-R-R-E-L-L -L at sandiego.edu or Dr. Smith, who I think you've also received her emails. My name is Dr. Terrell. I am from the Political Science and International Relations Department. Um, I'm really excited about this and excited to get to know many of you. And I'm also excited um, at the chance to, to get to know some of you in classes starting in the fall um, and in your next over the next four years. It's going to be a real adventure for you. And um, it's always our joy as professors to see you from beginning to end. Um, it's, it's a bittersweet moment when you graduate and we've gotten to see you for over four years really um, grow to become very, not only informed, but engaged um, citizens of the world. Okay, I'm going to, uh, to rein myself in before I get too sappy here and hand it over to um, four just really amazing professors. Um, it's, it's such, should be such a joy for you all to get to hear them speak today. I will be in the chat. Feel free to have conversations in the chat with each other. And by the way, this is a good chance for you to get to know each other a bit too. Some maybe some first friendships forming here in our class um, and to ask any questions, but we are gonna hold questions. Um, you know, if you wanna direct questions to the professors, we'll hold that till the very end. Um, so please, if you have a question that's either logistical or you want to queue up a question, you can throw it in the chat, but if you'd like to ask a question directly, let's wait until the presentations are over. Can everybody see the chat? Can you open the chat box and see the messages that with the Calendly link, for example? Just wanna make sure. Great, that's fantastic. Okay, without further ado, I'm going to hand it over to our team of um, fantastic professors today who are going to give you some really excellent presentations. Well, then I'll get started. Welcome everybody to USD. Uh, my name is uh, Professor Dominguez. I am a political scientist, like Dr. Terrell. Um, I study American politics and I'm gonna kick us off, we're gonna be talking a lot about the media today. And I'm gonna kick us off talking about the relationship between being having an informed citizenry and having a thriving democracy. So I will share my screen and we'll get going. So like I said, um, I'm, my, my 20 minutes today, I'm gonna introduce some research and some things for you to think about, about the relationship between democracy and informed citizenry, um, both in terms of those broad concepts and, and this sort of collective entity of having an informed citizenry and what, you know, why is that important? And also to start you thinking about your own place in that um, and your own relationship to your government and to uh, your fellow your the, the your fellow country mates um, and uh, and your your role and responsibilities in helping to create an informed citizenry and informing yourself so the the basic question that I'm going to be talking about today is why having um, why public information, as a public good is important to democracy and why having knowledge 
is important to representative democracy. Um, and, you know, when you go to college, a lot of what you're thinking about is how am I going to learn things that are useful for me, for my career, for making money, for supporting my family and all of these very important things. Um, you know, but there are other positive externalities of um, your going to college. And one of them is helping to create a body of, of, of citizens and residents um, and, and other participants in, in the world that um, can positively, uh, that, that being informed can positively affect um, the health of the US democracy. I wanna talk a little bit about why that's the case. So let's start with reason number one. Um, Representative democracy was the which is the type of government that we have, um, and there are some people who might call that a republic. Um, there must, but most most political scientists will say republican a republic and a democracy are functionally equivalent. We, I'm happy to have that conversation at some other time. But representative government generally um, means that we elect people to make laws on our behalf, um, and having a representative government that produces something like the public good or produces what the public wants or is is producing good things other than just you know corruption and tyranny means that we want those people to be capable and we can think about capable they could have a whole conversation about what capability means but it probably means something like you know literacy and awareness of the world around them and um uh, being able to think about the interests of others and not just themselves so however you define capable we want people who serve in government to be capable. Information then helps uh, the, the citizens of a country, the voters, select people who are capable. Um, you know, we could select our representatives by lottery, but we don't. We vote for them. Um, and that means that we are supposed to be using some kind of information, um, and partisanship is a type of information, and um, you know, biography and identity are all types of information that we use to say, I would like, I think this person is a better representative than that person. And part of what we're hopefully selecting for is people who will do a good job actually running the government. Information of various types should help us do that. The second thing, second feature of representative democracy is that officials in a democracy should be held accountable to the public. That is when they do bad things, they should be removed from positions of power over others. That's the whole idea of democratic representative government. Um, and again, information helps us, the voters, to critically evaluate the performance of those who are in power and to say, I believe you have made mistakes or you have been corrupt or you have um, you know, not acted in the public interest, or I just don't, I don't like the way that you're, you know, doing your job as a public official. And information about their job helps us to um, kick them out of office when they're doing what we think is a bad job. The characteristic of, of info, the relationship between information and democracy is how widely information is spread. A broadly and equitably informed citizenry means that those who are in power um, have to be accountable to a wider range of the citizens, right? Um, if information about government is only tightly, if only a small number of people have access to information about who's in government and what they're doing and what the government is doing, um, then that's the only group of people who can, who can act to uh, you know, have their interests represented and hold the government accountable. So it's not just that people need to be informed, but that it's really beneficial to everyone if um, the if those who are in government um, are are determined are, are chosen by a wide range of people. So knowledge asymmetry um, can translate into an asymmetry of power over outcomes. Um, and an ability to reward and punish representatives. And so we don't just want to have an informed citizenry that's able to choose capable officials and hold those account officials accountable, but we want that breadth of that knowledge to be spread broadly in the population so that the whole population can participate in that process. So political, you know, one of the things that political scientists and other social science scientists do is we take these ideas, this conversation about um, 
having an informed citizenry and how that might be theoretically important to democracy. And then we try to break that down into things that we can observe and measure and, and actually test in the real world. So um, political knowledge is a concept that political scientists and, and other researchers have thought about and, and tried to measure. So let me talk a little bit about what do we mean as political scientists when we talk about knowledge. So there's there's kind of three three types of knowledge that we think are important, um, and as I'll talk about later, there's actually there's actually more to it than that. Um, but if we're just when we do tests of political knowledge, we kind of want to know: Do people basically know what the government is and what it does? Can you name the three branches of government? Do you know? Does your city have a mayor? Do you happen to know? Um, you know? Do you do you know where your state capital is? Do you know how many? branches there are in your state legislature, like do you, do you basically know the basic civic rules and institutions? And um, a second a second thing that we think it's an, an important component of sort of knowledge about the public space is do you, do you have a basic idea about what's going on? If people are talking about abortion, do you know what an abortion is? Um, do you know where, when people are talking about criminal justice reform, do you know what that means? Do you know how to how a court works? Do you know what a lawyer does? Do you know what a civil liberty, you know what the civil liberties are? So those are the types of basic questions that we think sort of fall into the bucket of the substance of politics. And then there's the people who are actually in government doing the job. And so do you know who the president is? Do you know who the speaker of the house is? Do you know who your governor is? Do you know who represents you at various levels? And so when political scientists go out to find out, okay, so how many people do know about the government that they, you know, the American democracy, these are the type, we, we ask surveys, we ask surveys of random um, numbers of Americans or representative samples of Americans in various, various sort of well done surveys. And we, we, then we look at people's answers and we look at relationships between the answers they give and other types of behavior that they engage in. So for example, most people know who the US president is, most people know that the First Amendment protects the freedom of speech. Answers to other questions have generally people have lower, um, lower, lower rates of correct answers on other types of questions. But we can we can assess those kinds of things with surveys. And there's lots of fun surveys. You know, when if you take a, a class from me, we, there's there's other fun surveys out there from the Pew Research Center and um, you know, PBS that and late night talk show hosts will go out and do sort of fun surveys with people. There's lots of ways to ask similar kinds of questions and get, get a sense of people's responses. So having measured political knowledge, um, you know, we can also ask, okay, so we have these ideas about how political knowledge might be related to the health of a democracy. Can we back, so can, can we tie that? So we've got an independent variable, political knowledge. Can we tie that to any meaningful, dependent variables, any meaningful outcomes, any meaningful characteristics of democratic citizenship. And the fact of the matter is, yes, we can. <laughs> um, research shows that more informed citizens are better able to hold their representatives accountable, and they're better citizens in other ways too. Um, and there's a great book that mm -hmm. I highly recommend. It's one of my very favorite books. It's called uh, what Americans know about politics and why it matters from 1997. Um, and that I'm gonna be quoting um, some results from that book. So, you know, one of the, I'll, I'll, go, th I'll go through some of the key findings about political knowledge here. Um, you know, one of the, the first one is the more informed a person is, the more likely they are to have the same opinion over a long period of time. That is, they have an, a considered opinion, not just like a random response to someone who calls them on the phone and asks them a question. A lot of what gets measured in, po in polls is just people being like, get that one, just to get, you know, just to get through the interview. Um, but real political knowledge produces stable opinions over time. So if someone calls you today and then calls you in two months, and in both cases asks you, you know, what you think are the causes of climate change, you should, if it's a real opinion, you should have the same answer to, um, at both of those, both of those times that you're asked. And that's one of the things that this research finds, that the more political knowledge you have, um, the more the better able you're, you are to answer questions like, who's the president and what does a judge do? Um, you're, the more you know generally uh, about, about politics and government, um, the more likely you are to also know about those other things, about what an abortion is and, and, and to have a, a considered long-term opinion about what to do about those things. 
people are also more likely to act on opinions that, that are considered, not just they're, they're not going to get into politics because they have a thought today. And then two months from now, change that thought. Right. So the active being active is dependent on that knowledge as well. Second finding is that the more knowledgeable a person is about public affairs, the more likely you are to connect your opinions, the more likely those those uh, those voters are to connect their opinions to the language and actions of elected officials. So elected officials talk in a particular language. They talk about liberalism and progressivism and conservatism, and they, they, they know what the party platforms are, and they understand why some ideas go with one party and some ideas go with another party, and which groups are associated with the parties and who supports the people in power. And they can explain you know, why things are the way they are. But a lot of, um, if citizens are very uninformed, they may not understand, you know, the whole range, the whole package of opinions that they're voting for when they vote for a Republican or they vote for a Democrat. So if we're going to effectively choose elites to act on our behalf in running the government and to hold them accountable, it's, it's really important that we talk the same language that they talk. And political knowledge helps us to do that. The more informed we are, the more we understand what a Democrat and a Republican is, what a conservative and a progressive is, and why they're different. Um, and, and to connect who we vote for to the policies that we think we're going to get if they win. And so again, there's research shows that those who um, have higher political knowledge, um, those are those those lines that slope up there. Um, the, those those curvy lines are the ones that people who have more knowledge are, are they're more likely to, if they say they're a conservative, vote for the Republican. And if they say they're a liberal, vote against the Republican. But people with very little political knowledge are like, yeah, I, I don't know anything. I'll be a progressive and vote for the Republican. And that's, that's not a, that's not a well-considered opinion that connects that person's beliefs perhaps to who they vote for. Um, the next finding is that the more informed a person is, the more likely they are to participate in the political system at all. And of course, representative government serves those who, who participate. You can't make a difference if you don't participate. Um, and the more knowledge you have, the more likely you are to vote to get involved in politics in other ways. Perhaps even more importantly, um, you know, political democratic citizenship requires adherence to certain norms and values, one of the most important of which is political tolerance, that is a willingness to exp uh, permit the expression or ideas um, of interests of or, or interests of someone who thinks differently than you. Um, and the more political knowledge you have, um, the more likely you are to also adhere to important norms like political tolerance. So basically, political knowledge is a good thing. The more that people know about our political system, the more likely they are to be um, the kinds of citizens that will produce a healthy democracy. But if we can go back to that first chart, um, you know, people know who the president is, but they really they don't know who their senators are. They don't know who the representatives are. Most people don't know what an abortion is or what or what Roe versus Wade said. Like, actually, our political knowledge levels are kind of surprisingly and, and perhaps frighteningly low, um, given what we kind of want in a democratic republic. Um, given that we need uh, an informed citizenry to hire capable officials to run the government and to um, ensure that they are held accountable. But before we just, you know, think that that's too bad, I want to point out some of the reasons why it's hard to be informed about public life in the United States. Um, the first thing is, there's just a lot to know about the world, right? If you want to understand uh, world politics, you need to understand history. If you want to understand the political developments in the United States, you need to understand history. You need to understand economics. You need to understand, if you want to understand pandemics, you need to know a little bit about biology. Um, if you want to, want to understand climate change, you need to understand something about, um, you know, sort of atmospheric conditions and physics and that kind of thing. So, and of course, knowing more about politics itself is, is useful to participating. So there's, there's really just a lot to know. 
and this is one place where your liberal arts education isn't just about informing you for a career and making money. It's a it's a way that you we can inform people about all of the different um, facets of life together on this planet that help us be more informed citizens. Our system of second reason that it's hard to be informed in the United States is our system is complicated. Um, we have a national government in Washington, but we also have 50 state governments. Um, and that difference we call, or that relationship between the states and the federal government, uh, we call federalism in political science and law. Um, and so it can be hard to know of what level of government to get mad at about um, you know, police misconduct. Is that a local problem? Is that something I should be mad at the mayor about? Should I be mad at state laws? Is that something Joe Biden can do something about? Who should I be mad at? And who should I talk to if I want to make a change? So federalism makes that hard and it makes citizenship in the United States require more knowledge even than in a lot of other um, democracies. Oops. Um, third reason that it's hard to be an informed citizen in the United States is that it's hard to be a democratic citizen. Um, it means that we're gonna have to deal with conflict and disagreement and uncertainty about what the most important problems are, what causes them and how to solve them. Um, and then we have to understand how those disagreements are resolved both at the ballot box and through legislative and sometimes judicial processes um, that are, you know, boring and hard to learn about sometimes. Um, but uh, so living in a democracy, any democracy, it requires patience and understanding um, and a lot of information. In addition, um, a lot of uh, research is researchers talk about the fact that a lot of essential functions of government we don't even see we're not even really aware of like until they go wrong right um, having clean water that the trash gets picked up that the roads are you know maintained but also things like social security and medicare people don't even know that those are government programs sometimes by by definition if if diseases are cured and uh you know astronauts land on the moon those are good things people may not know what government's role is in any of those things, um, or, or you know, is it is it better if government is more involved or less involved? And it's really you have to be paying a lot of attention um, to figure all of that out. And then, as as the other panelists will talk more about, um, our news environment is really sensational. Um, media companies, their job is not to inform democratic citizenry. They may have a, some kind of ethical obligation to do so, but that is not their mission. Um, media companies, are their goal is to make money and they do that by selling us information. And we collectively are more interested in buying information that is emotional and outrageous and that shows um, you know, triumph and danger in sports and con you know, conflict and, and uh, emotion rather than you know, detailed public policy. Um, that is maybe better for us to be informed. So all of this is to say, um, it is hard to be an informed citizen, and yet it's really important. It's informed. It's important to be a, an important whatever whatever part of the country or the world that you are a citizen of. It's important to be informed about as much of the world as you can be. Um, your liberal arts education. The good news is your liberal arts education can help you be a more informed and efficacious citizen. And it's it's a great orientation to beginning college to think about all of the opportunities you have to take classes that help you achieve that, that goal. Um, and also, as the other panelists will talk more about, your media, your own personal media and information diet will affect your ability to be an informed and eff effective, efficacious citizen. Um, but that this is hard work. Um, and it's something that uh, is valuable, but it's it's hard to see exactly how valuable it is. And hopefully, um, I've given you some ideas about um, you know what the facts are about about why it's so important to to have an informed citizenry and what you know what you might how you might think about um, uh, using your education to help you help you become a more informed citizen. So I'll leave it there and turn it over to Dr. Moran. Great, thank you, Dr. Dominguez. <clears throat> um, I am going to be sharing some information about journalism and I will spend some time, hopefully giving you, <laughs> I, I hope some inspiration about, yes, there's a lot to critique about journalism and how it operates in our 
political environment, but then also some tools to get you able to find out when it is okay um, to believe and trust the news media. So my name is Dr. Moran. I'm a professor in the um, Department of Communication. We study media outlets. We study the economics of media. I study the relationship that audiences have with their media use, use both in terms of journalism, but then also entertainment. I teach classes. I, I'm teaching one in the fall called Children in Media. So you can find out what happens to your future children or to what happened to you as you were growing up interacting with all those cartoons. And then in addition, communication is an interdisciplinary um, area of study. So we have a lot of faculty who look at face-to-face -face interactions, organizational communication, what happens in your interpersonal relationships, small groups. So if you are interested in communication, we definitely have quite a variety of um, classes that we offer. Um, so I'm going to really make a case for journalism today and talk about the relationship that we know occurs between citizens and their media use. So there is a relationship between what type of news you consume and your political knowledge and your likelihood to participate as a citizen in our democracy. So this really will, I hope, help um, demonstrate the information that the political scientists offer us and then how that really can be something that a citizen can harness. And if you want to learn more, your liberal arts education, as we've pitched, is definitely gonna be an important tool for you the people you know and talk to in your life also give you political information and provide um, you know, influence over your political decisions. But of course, the news media and other types of media, not just news, because sometimes we learn about politics even from movies and entertainment and other things. Um, so it's all wrapped up into the kind of interactions we have and what that does for us as citizens. So. As I say, journalism matters. I think it does, ma it matters you, and you should be paying attention to it. And we have a variety of media outlets that you can choose from. I, um, you know, I put a couple of logos up here because what we know over time is that we have moved from, you know, kind of what we consider traditional mass media sources where, you know, editors, gatekeepers create information and then send it to you to now social media where all sorts of people are putting up their opinion in a variety of um, venues. So let's see if I can change my slide. Um, so the role of journalism, Dr. Dominguez mentioned, obviously, that it's really important for a democratic society to have informed citizens. And although many media outlets do have a primary goal of kind of a business perspective, making sure that they are selling your eyeballs to the advertisers through infotainment, um, there is some good journalism out there. There are outlets where you can find high quality information that's free from bias, that gives you factual data, that can help you make decisions. And in a perfect world, when we talk about like really the role of journalism is not to tell you what to think, right? But it's to give you information from a variety of perspectives. So you as a citizen can take your Per belief system and apply it to this information to then ideally figure out if those politicians are capable, if they're the ones you want to vote into office, if they are doing their job appropriately based on your perspective. So from an ideal perspective, our journalism functions as a watchdog. It provides us with information as citizens of the United States to help us function as a democratic society. We also hope that our journalists serve as a check on those politicians when they are elected into office. Are they behaving ethically? Are they voting in a way that we can predict based on their campaign, based on their promises? Um, are they serving our interests? In addition to our politicians, our journalists function as checks on other institutions. They serve as checks on um, big business on corporations, on higher education, on all of these institutions that we as citizens hope are operating in our best interest. And when they're not, 
We need to rally, make changes, um, vote in different ways, have recall elections. You know, maybe we boycott certain companies because we find out information that we are not, you know, that don't align with our goals. So all of those different things, we hope that we can find out through journalism. And then lastly, the role of journalism is to help us feel like we belong, right? To have a sense of community, that we are citizens of a nation, that there is an opportunity for us to be kind of in this together, to have community engagement. And in the early, like, you know, in the early days, I'm not even say early days, but back in like the 70s, say, um, 1970s, you know, there was, the, there was a lot of connection between people who subscribed to newspapers and how much they believed in their community. And so there was this relationship between news consumption and really paying for the right to have that um, newspaper subscription come to your house and how much you felt connected to your local environment. And it also was connected to trust. The more you consumed media or consumed news, the more likely you were to trust your neighbor, which is kind of crazy in our environment today. But there was this strong belief in that um, learning about your neighbors, learning about the school board, learning about what was happening down the street actually made you feel connected to that local environment. What we've noticed more recently is local news isn't quite functioning in the same way as it used to. Let's, we'll just leave it at that for now. Oops, wrong way. Okay, so the early days, right? When I'm talking about, you know, I hope that you had a chance to do the reading that I posted in our um, Blackboard site. It kind of traced the role of journalism over time. And, you know, what's interesting is really we live in this environment now where we're very, it's it's very easy to critique the news media. There's a lot of people where there's just, we've lost trust in some of our national media outlets. We are less likely to um, turn to news for factual information. We've seen a rise of, you know, even cable news outlets that are more opinion-based rather than fact-based. But this relationship between the concern about political influence in the press is not new. In fact, in the 1800s, our newspapers were very much connected to political parties. We called it a partisan press. So what newspaper you picked up meant that you expected to have a little political bias, that it was going to support one point of view over another. And that's okay because people knew it, right? It wasn't a secret. And there was a partisan perspective in the press that allowed you know, folks to get a range of viewpoints. When we think about the phrase that Dr. Dominguez used, that political tolerance, this was a way to understand what the other you know, groups were thinking. And you could, you know, maybe you disagreed with the, you know, the way that they were handling a particular current issue but you understood it and there were, then you could look at that newspaper and then you could pick up the newspaper that more aligned with your political um, viewpoint. And so that there was this variety of, of information out there. Early days of journalism still was concerned about its goal of, of, a, of, a pre, of having a commercial, um, you know, kind of that, the, the ultimate goal of providing this information was to sell advertising space. So as soon as the newspaper industry moved to kind of fighting for viewer or fighting for readers so that they could sell advertising, there was a concern about whether that was in, impact the type of news you would see. And if you've heard in your kind of history classes of the era of yellow journalism, you know, this is the time period where absolutely the ethics, the um, information that was provided in the news was sensational. It was, you know, kind of exaggerated information so that people would buy that newspaper over another. There was splashy headlines and cool photos and, you know, lots of things were doctored and made up and all of the things that we worry about in, in, a, in our current news media environment were happening in the turn of the century, well, turn of the 19th century. And so you have really similar concerns. Then over time, newspaper, newspapers, the physical you know, newspaper that we used to think of as the hallmark of journalism, 
started to go into decline. The first new technology that really challenged newspaper readership was the radio. And you started having concerns about on the spot reporting. And could the radio actually fool citizens, like fool audiences by providing information that was not accurate? And we found out that indeed, sometimes the radio can fool us. And so that was really kind of an introduction to um, a new way of distributing information. And then of course, with television, there was a lot of suspicion about news reporting in, on TV. You know, this concern that it was gonna be more flashy, that, we, that the journalists themselves had to be pretty, right? They had to be anchors to get on television. And so did that undermine the credibility of journalism itself? Questions there. And then of course, with social media that I'll talk about a little bit more in just a minute. Um, the other thing that started happening in the 1980s was a consolidation of ownership. So in fact, fewer people owned the news media outlets and the distribution of information was consolidated. So we just didn't have as much differentiation in news than we did in the early days. The other thing that we start to recognize is over time, your news media outlet choice does impact how you see the world. So even though we have a foundation of, a, of an objective press and that you should be able to reach any media outlet and um, access a variety of information, there's a connection between your political knowledge and your political ideology and what, where you get your news. And so for some people who get their news from more conservative outlets, they're going to have a different viewpoint, sometimes even different facts than people who get information from other media outlets. But nevertheless, journalism is an industry that, like any good business, adapts with the times and has been able to um, continue to function in, in various ways through the new technologies, through different outlets, through different administrations um, politically and really has continued in my opinion to remain, remain relevant. Now, if we think about the biggest concern most recently is the relationship between journalism and social media. So we know um, people college age um, are what we're calling now generation Z um, are more likely to access information from social media accounts than traditional or what we might call legacy media. And we also know that there is a whole lot of things happening behind the scenes in the social media algorithm business model that functions differently than the traditional way we used to distribute information. So social media itself is not problematic but not understanding the difference between misinformation, fake news, what's politics and what's opinion on those social media accounts can be problematic to your political knowledge and then also how much you might be able to participate in democracy. Again, misinformation isn't new, fake news isn't really that new. Um, the, you know, getting your political opinion into the news isn't that new, but now, you as kind of a, a search person on your social media account, it's really a lot muddier in the social media algorithm, you know, because now what, what is an advertisement? What is a public relations feed? You know, who is the source of this information? All of that, which kind of was more clear when you were watching ABC Nightly News with your parents, really is all mixed up together. So it's harder, kind of going back again to Dr. Dominguez, being an informed citizen is not an easy task. And social media is making it a little bit harder for us because it's harder to find out who is responsible for that information. Who put this story out there? Who's, you know, whose facts are these? And how do we check that in other media outlets to figure out what the actual story is? Okay, so when we think about our new environment of social media versus our legacy media, um, a lot of it has to do with laws and regulations and you know who's accountable for the information. So in like a traditional news journalism outlet like the New York Times or you know broadcast television news, 
there's people who are watching to make sure you don't do things that are illegal as a journalist, right? You have to tell the truth. You need to make sure that you are providing accurate information. You can't violate libel laws, which we won't go into in too much detail, but it's essentially if you're a journalist, you need to be telling, you know, um, truthful information. And, you know, in a social media realm, we haven't really figured out how to apply the same ethical or legal standards because right now, Facebook and Instagram and TikTok and you know all of these outlets are not considered publishers. They're not the ones responsible. The corporations are not the ones responsible for the information. So there's less like there's a less likelihood that they will regulate or um, kind of control the information that's being provided because the person or the people who are responsible are the individuals who are posting that, whether they're an organization or an, just an individual citizen. So the, the company doesn't, isn't held accountable in the same way that like the New York Times could be held accountable for what their journalists publish. So that becomes kind of tricky. In traditional news media, there is again, an ethical responsibility, I would argue more often than not, to serve the public interest. That indeed, there, you know, if you talk to individual journalists, they really think that they are a participant in our democracy, that there is some really good reason why they need to provide information to citizens. Um, and they do, they serve the public interest. There is also an easier distinction for us as consumers to make between traditional news, like the factual, um, kind of objective news and public opinion or editorial and opinion type pieces in traditional news legacy media. So if you go to a cable news outlet like Fox News and you're watching Tuck Tucker Carlson, you kind of know that he's going to come with his opinions and it's not the same as watching kind of your broadcast national news media during the six o'clock hour. So you kind of know what to expect. The so social media companies, they don't have an obligation to the public interest. They don't even pretend to have an obligation to the public interest. They really are in it for the money. Um, we've seen that the divisive type of information that's provided on social media really does not support the political tolerance that is kind of foundational to a healthy democratic society where we thrive on debate, where truth emerges from debate. And in, it, it's not really well-informed or consistent over time. So that becomes problematic. And then in general, misinformation, like literally people spreading lies on social media to persuade and do misinformation campaigns, or some would even argue disinformation campaigns. And when we talk about propaganda, there's a little bit of a distinction there, but really trying to fool us on purpose is kind of bad. Okay. Um, and then also just economically, like they they function differently. So in legacy media, it's a commercial uh, system where news outlets sell advertising space, and based on who the people are in your audience, you can get more money, right? And so you, the more people you have, the more money you can get. Um, but not very many people are watching the news anymore, even on TV, right? We're like five to seven million viewers on average per night. That's like a tiny portion of our world. And so it's just, you know, and not to overemphasize like generational gaps, but it's your parents and it's your grandparents who are watching the news, you know, in the evening. I still like my, you know, local television news at night, but I think I'm the last generation here probably. Um, and so people are shifting to social media. And what that means is that social media makes money on subscribers, right? So when you download that app, you're not maybe not paying for that. But the fact that you are now a consumer of that product means that you become the thing they're selling to advertised content. Um, they're using algorithms to curate you <laughs> in what you see. And so that becomes a way for them to make money. And then who are these people on social media? On our legacy media, they've got their trained journalists most likely they're college educated. They've had some ethical training. They may have, um, you know, some mentoring editors, other people who are in the newsroom to make sure that the information that they're, you know, providing is accurate. 
social media, it's who knows, right? There, um, there's different content curators, there's programmers who might manipulate content, there's nano influencers who do stuff for uncompensated labor, then we've got like the major influencers who are compensated, but they don't have to disclose that they're compensated to the public, so who knows why they're doing stuff. So it's just a hodgepodge of who is creating the content on social media versus actual employees and professionals who might be creating content in legacy media. Okay, so lastly, why does it matter? I mean, I think it matters because you wanna know who you're getting your information from. Who are, who, who is the source? What, what can you know about the source? And how does that help you to trust the information? Um, I think that in the future, we may see more government oversight into social media co corporations because, well, it'll depend on who gets elected into the next administration perhaps, but you know, realistically, there, there has been enough, I think it's kind of momentum in the past couple of years to recognize that Facebook left unchecked might not be the best for our society. All of these corporations without some sort of government oversight or at least um, kind of commercial regulation um, is gonna be important. The other thing that's really, I think, something for us to consider, and this is kind of related to the assignment that we're giving you this week, is the idea of filter bubbles. Um, what we know now is as people access information more frequently in a social media platform, you are less likely to get information that contradicts your predispositions. So you already believe in something. So then you search for information about that topic. Social media provides you with information that is consistent with what you already believe. So then you like it and then you get more of it. And so in a social media algorithm phone, right? You're, on, you're more likely to only see information that feeds your pre-existing perspectives. And then sometimes even gets more extreme um, as you continue in that little filter bubble. Whereas in traditional news media outlets, right? Even if you listen to NPR and the radio, for example, if you're driving, I know no one uses the radio anymore, but if you did, you'll hear stories that you don't even know that you like thought we were interesting. It's like random stuff just comes on the radio. And as a result, you're getting exposed to information that you didn't even know was important because you hadn't thought about it before. And journalism should function kind of in the same way as the classes that we're going to force you to take is that you need to be exposed to things you don't even know about, right? You need to learn new ideas that are surprising, that might challenge the way you think about things, that actually provide like a contrary viewpoint. And it's not necessarily to say that you should completely change your belief system because you heard something new, but maybe that just adds into how you understand the way you see the world. And so, you know, I really think that we as consumers and as citizens need to be conscientious and ask ourselves, am I only seeing information that feeds what I already believe in? And if so, like, how do I get out of this bubble, <laughs> right? How can, how can I find something else new? And then finally, we need to check ourselves and check our sources to make sure that when we are reading information, are getting information, that we can trust it, that it is accurate, that it does have some factual basis to it, that the facts themselves are not being manipulated in some way to reinforce ideas that don't make sense. So I think that both in terms of regulation, it's important when the government helps us, helps our institutions <laughs> behave ethically, but also we need to regulate ourselves in making sure that we have opportunities to learn and kind of expand our way of thinking about things. So I am going to leave it at that because those are the discussion questions for when we get together this week. And I look forward to talking more about this either today or in our discussion section. And I will turn it to Dr. Donnelly. Okay, so I am Megan Donnelly. 
you're welcome to call me Megan. No need to call me doctor. Um, if you want to, you can, but not important to me. Um, so I'm a sociocultural anthropologist. I work in the anthropology department here at uh, the University of San Diego. And I'm a little bit of an unusual sociocultural anthropologist um, in terms of what I study. And so I have a little bit of overlap with um, Professor Moran's um, field of study, communication study, um, because my work focuses on news and knowledge production. So um, my research that I do is uh, called ethnographic field work, which means that I go to a particular place and I spend time with people, observing them, participating with them and what they do. And my research has been with journalists. So that means following journalists around and observing the way that they craft news stories. Um, but I'm also interested in knowledge production more broadly. So within my own field, anthropology, thinking about how anthropologists have crafted knowledge about different parts of the world, historically about uh, non-Western societies or indigenous societies, um, and now in many other parts of the world. And I'm also very interested broadly in power and social change. So for instance, in the context where I do my research in Mexico, Mexico in the past uh, decade or so has become one of the most dangerous places in the world to practice journalism. So there, I'm really interested in power as it relates to dynamics of violence and organized crime, um, violence that's exercised by the government or by organized crime groups or other powerful individuals. But I'm also interested in power in terms of its relationship to more subtle dynamics, right? And that's what I'm gonna be thinking about a little bit today with you. And I'm interested in knowledge as it relates to social change. And we'll talk a little bit about that today. Um, so as I said, I do my research in Mexico and also at the Mexico-US border. And I just included a little here too that I am a major cat lover. True story that I walked out of my office um, and walked down the hallway and there was a kitten in the hallway and I lost my cool. It was a stray kitten that had wandered in from outside and it was adorable. Um, and I am a compulsive, very neat organized person. So this photo is actually from my field research in Mexico. It is a newspaper archive. Um, and you know, this sort of space is the kind where I go in and, and say, oh, I would really love to clean that place up. But in this space where this desk over here is where the person who was in charge of the archive would have been sitting, he knew exactly where everything was. So he had an order to his chaos in this very, very messy space. Okay, so today I'm gonna to be talking a little bit uh, about media literacy and what's called critical media literacy. So what I wanna start by talking about is how this is more than just fighting fake news, which you know has been the, the focus of, of recent years. Um, and then I'm gonna to shift to an example about objectivity in US journalism as an example of what I mean by really thinking critically when we are reading or watching or listening to news. And I'll end by giving some sort of broad questions for you all you know, as you're starting your liberal arts education, some broad questions for reading critically or listening critically or watching TikTok videos critically, whatever it is that you're doing to get your news. Okay, so if we start by thinking about media literacy, the National Association for Media Literacy Education defines media literacy in this very broad way, right? The ability to access, analyze, evaluate, create and act using all forms of communication, right? And most of you will have no problem accessing communication, right? Accessing these different messages. Um, but often we're focusing on thinking about helping people learn to analyze and evaluate 
the messages that they're getting from different forms of communication. And then from there also to think about how they're going to create their own messages and how they're going to act based on the, the messages that they find. So as I said in my introduction, we often think about this, I mean, for, for good reason in relation to fake news, right? Fake news is the thing that a lot of us are really concerned about. And I've heard from my students, you know, that people are, are concerned about not knowing whether the news that they're finding or the information they're finding out in the world is true or false um, and not really knowing how to navigate that environment. So it makes good sense that we are often thinking about media literacy in relation to fake news. So we often see things like this. Right, we see these kinds of infographics that are trying to help provide some clues and some tools for people to navigate the media environment by asking, you know, how can you tell if a piece of information or a piece of news is true or false, right? Thinking about where it comes from, who the author is, um, checking the date on, you know, for instance, for photos that are often repurposed from different contexts. Um, and, and used in a different one, trying to figure out whether it actually is just a joke, right? Whether it is a parody or whether it's meant to be funny rather than a real piece of news. Um, you know, reading beyond, for instance, the, the initial story you found to see are other news sources reporting the same thing, are reputable news sources reporting the same thing. So, all of this is very important, right? And we do need to develop media literacy around these things because we do know that fake information and fake news spreads much faster on social media than it does in a traditional media environment. So this is very important. Um, and, you know, and you definitely need to develop media literacy around this. But what I want us to think about today is expanding media literacy beyond just thinking about discerning whether a piece of information or a piece of news is fake or true. And so that is what scholars call critical media literacy, right? And critical media literacy, as I think about it, means that we need to carefully evaluate not just the fake news, right? We need to, we don't just need to do the work of discerning, is this real or is this fake? But we also need to turn a critical lens to real news, to reputable news, to, uh, to credible news. And as we do that, we think about the relationship between knowledge and power. So I thought it was great Professor Dominguez used uh, the example of the, the public um, campaign, uh, The More You Know, right? Which I think is from late eighties and I think still exists now. Um, and so that's the way often we think about the relationship between knowledge and power in the sense that knowledge is empowering, right? Knowledge is empowers us to be able to, um, act as more informed citizens to um, make decisions in a more informed way. But another way to think about the relationship between knowledge and power is that knowledge, and I consider news stories and images to be forms of knowledge, they're powerful because they can shape how we see and understand and imagine the world the people within it and ourselves, right? The way that we think about ourselves and thus how we act in the world. And that can be a good or a bad thing, right? Because if we look, for instance, at, at my discipline, anthropology, um, a lot of the ideas about race and about the existence of races that are the basis of, of a lot of the racist ideologies that we have now came from anthropological knowledge, right? They came from uh, uh, authoritative knowledge being produced by anthropologists. So knowledge is really powerful, uh, not only in the sense that it empowers us, but that it can be used also to perpetuate inequality or to, to per perpetuate wrongdoing in the world. 
So as we think about this, and as we try to develop a, a kind of critical media literacy approach, when we're looking at a piece of news, you know, after we've done the very careful work and the necessary work of making sure that that piece of news is a piece of real news and is not fake news, we have to dig a little bit deeper beyond that and do a little bit more work beyond that. Um, and so these are some of the questions that we can start with. We can ask how particular groups of people or places or practices, et cetera, are represented in the news. And what that means is what are the kinds of words that are used to portray them? What, what are the kinds of images that are used to portray them? How do those words and images populate our own imagination? You know, particularly you can think about this in relation to a place where you've never been, right? Or a group of people that you know nothing about. How, when you read about them or when you see an image of them, does that start to populate your way of thinking about them? Another question we can ask are, what are the kinds of ideas and values that, commu that news communicates? And this can be explicit. It can come out and say directly um, what its values are. Um, but often this also happens implicitly, right? Where there are implicit values that are being communicated through news. And then finally, as we're thinking about this, you know, uh, uh, for me, I'm starting from the standpoint that we live in an unequal society and we live in an unequal world. And so when we're looking at those representations and when we're trying to figure out what the ideas and the values are that are being communicated in the news, we can ask ourselves, are those representations, are those ideas, are those values reinforcing inequality? Are they challenging inequality? Are they calling it into question? Or are they reproducing the status quo, right, in an unequal world? And we can also think about who benefits from them and who is hurt by them. And you can think about that, of course, in terms of who makes money from a piece of news, right, or, or who makes money from um, fake information that's being spread around. But I actually mean this in a much deeper sense in terms of who benefits from them. If we live in an unequal world and a particular news story and the ideas and the values and the representations that it is spreading reproduce inequality, right? Then particular groups are going to be hurt by those representations and other groups, the dominant groups will benefit from them, right? So aside from thinking about how news is lucrative, which it absolutely is, um, you know, really thinking about this at a deeper level in terms of power dynamics. Okay, so I, the, I just want to talk very briefly, I'm trying to be brief here because I know people's attention spans are are not long as mine is not. Um, I want to talk just for a minute about objectivity, right? And thinking about how we can turn this kind of critical media literacy approach towards thinking about real journalism, right? Real news, reputable news, like the kind produced by an organization like the, the New York Times, for instance thinking about how objectivity works within US journalism and thinking about whether it promotes uh, inequality, whether it challenges inequality. And again, this happens in a much more subtle way. This is not an in your face, um, yellow journalism sort of way, right? So this requires a lot more close attention to, um, to the sort of subtext, reading between the lines when we are um, looking at a particular piece of news. So as Professor Moran mentioned, um, in the past in the United States, partisan journalism was the standard, right? And really objectivity has only been a central value in US journalism for about the past 100 years, right? Starting at the beginning of the 20th century about. Um, and all of you, I'm sure, have heard the word objectivity and are familiar with the word objectivity because it is a central value in the United States beyond just journalism, 
right? Within journalism, objectivity has been defined really actually in a lot of different ways. And so I've included three here that I think are, um, are quite common in US journalism in terms of thinking about what objectivity is and in terms of thinking about the values that, that journalists, journalists are attempting to, um, to follow. One way that objectivity has been defined is in relation to balance. And this is what we can think of when you hear people talking about both sides. Uh, it is not coincidental that we live in a country where there are two main political parties and that we think about balance being both sides, right? As if there were only two perspectives and we're going to represent both of them. And through that, we're going to find a sort of middle ground and that's where objectivity is going to, to lie. Another way that objectivity has been defined in US journalism is in relation to empiricism. Right? When we think about something empirical, we're talking about what we can observe and verify directly, right? What we can see with our eyes and hear and observe um, directly. And this is characterized often by the phrase, just the facts, right? That we are just presenting the facts to the audience and we are allowing the audience to then make their, their informed decision based on that presentation of the facts. And then finally, we often think about objectivity in US journalism in relation to neutrality, right? And this is where we often see the word unbiased, right? That we are presenting unbiased news, that it is not partisan, that it is not someone's subjective opinion. All of that sounds awesome, right? I mean, in the United States, we love objectivity. So that sounds great to us. That sounds like a very laudable, you know, wonderful goal. But in the past few years, and, and of course, there have been lots of critiques of objectivity in journalism over the years, but in the past few years, there have been more rumblings in the journalistic community about whether objectivity should really be a core goal uh, a core value in journalism, and what happens when we uh, make objectivity the central, um, the central goal of journalistic work. So the um, op-ed that I shared with you to read for today is a piece that is about this, right, that was written in June 2020. So let me just ask um, if anybody wants to jump into the chat and say what was going on in the world in June 2020, or we could think about in the United States in particular, just to make sure everybody is still alive out there and listening to us. Is anyone out there? Yeah, exactly. Thank you, Katarina. Um, so Black Lives Matter is going on, right? We have the murder of George Floyd in May of 2020. We have this huge resurgence of Black Lives Matter, not to mention that we were still at the, you know, really at the heart of the pandemic and all of the inequalities that the pandemic was exposing. Right, and so this op-ed is being written at a moment where the United States is really at a turning point in terms of thinking about how racism operates in the United States. And so when we think about objectivity then, we think about it with this critical lens towards how knowledge is produced, how facts are produced about the world, how news is made about the world what we have to ask ourselves is what counts, what gets to count as an objective truth, right? What particular facts gain authority in the world, right? And are, are seen to be common sense, if you will. And importantly, if we think back to, to this definition of objectivity in relation to neutrality, whose viewpoint is seen as neutral, right? Whose viewpoint becomes the stand-in for neutrality? And what 
most social scientists, uh, you know, understand about this is typically it is the dominant group in a society that determines what appears to be neutral. So in the United States, whiteness often stands in as neutral, as normal, as um, unembellished, right? And then thinking about how power and how um, inequality works, looking at objectivity, what voices and what perspectives and what truths end up being silenced in the name of objectivity. So in the op-ed that I had you read for today, the journalist is talking about how as a black reporter, he is being expected to write for an imagined white audience. Right? And he is expected to think about what would seem objective to that white audience. Right? And so really trying to think about these questions as we're reading, whether a piece of information is true or false is the important first question to ask. But then even if the information being presented is true, really thinking about how that information contributes to the structures of inequality in a society. So I thought I'd finish by um, giving you some questions that you can ask when you're reading or watching or listening to, because I know that many of you probably reading the news is not the principal way that you get the news. Um, so what kinds of questions you can ask when reading the news to really try to, to think critically, right? And one of the first questions you can ask is what assumptions is the writer or the speaker making, right? What assumptions do they make about the world, about a place, about a group of people, about an activity? Another question you can ask is what position they are writing or speaking from. And when I say that, I mean, are they positioned in, for instance, the United States as a white male who does not have a disability? Are they positioned as a transgender person? Um, are they positioned as somebody who comes from a working class background? Right. So really thinking about within an unequal world, what position that person is speaking from? Thinking about what the target audience of the article is. Um, and then, you know, in terms of thinking about what gets emphasized and what gets silenced, right, what are the perspectives that are emphasized or highlighted or uh, foregrounded in the article and what perspectives are absent? Um, what kind of impact the article might have, how people might act because of it, what kinds of ideas they might have about the world after reading it. And then thinking about yourself, um, and this is really important. Um, and, and goes back to what Dr. Moran was talking about, thinking about whether the article or the video or the podcast affirms or challenges your own assumptions about the world, right? And a really helpful question to ask here, because it can be so hard to really think beyond our own assumptions is, how might someone from a different background or from a different position interpret this article? And how might that be different than my own interpretation? Um, and I fully agree with the others who have said that really in a liberal arts education, one of the most wonderful things is exposing yourself to different ways of thinking, to different perspectives, to different kinds of questions about the world. And I'll end just by saying these kinds of questions do not only apply to reading the news or other forms of information that you might be getting on a day-to-day -day basis. We should also be asking these kinds of questions when we're reading academic texts. I am sure that my fellow panelists uh, would fully agree with me that if we assign you a text, we do not expect you to read it passively and just come to class and regurgitate to us what the, what the text has said. We want you really to grapple with it critically and to think about it critically. So um, I will end there. Very excited to um, talk with some of you further tomorrow morning. Thank you very much. After all of that, you now listen to mathematics. Mm, 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 how delicious. All right, my friends, so I've been you know, listening 
to the struggle with media and communication. And one thing that was mentioned is how even things like movies influence you. And I'll be honest with you, the thing I'm struggling with the most this morning is this James Bond movie, No Time to Die. I just watched it yesterday and I thought it was absolutely awful. Oh my gosh. I mean, after seeing Skyfall, what kind of a movie was that? It was the last 40 minutes of just torture. So anyway, that's part one of my struggle. The second thing is Top Gun Maverick. I saw it in the theater. I haven't seen the movie in the theater for a long time. Oh, phenomenal. I was yelling in tears. Oh, oh they got the F-14 going again. It was, it was awesome. So that was great. That's good. And the last thing is this new Mission Impossible is coming out, supposedly part one and two. The last one, Fallout, oh my gosh, with Superman as his arch rival, oh, his Gloria. So I'm just kind of hoping it's going to be great. So those are the main struggles in my life right now. I just wanted to share with you. Um, now let's go to the second struggles, which is issues. And I don't know, maybe I'd love for people, you know, I'd love for um, Professor Moran to talk about, you know, what my thoughts about movies are and what that tells, tells you about me. But um, those are the thoughts in my head. But, you know, when we think about math, I'm a mathematician. Um, I'm, I'm old. I've been doing this for 25, 30 years as a professor. I'm relatively new to USD, though I've been here six years. I'm, I'm sort of around now that I know people. But, um, but you know, when I think about math, when I talk to people and mathematician uh, and just friends and students, I know that 1% totally geek out on it, right? Like they're just like, mm, math, I um, love it. And they're like geometry, they, they do it. But then the other 99% of the people that I know get nauseous. You know, they think about trig and pre-calc and, you know, all their failures and how they didn't do so great or how they did calc A, B, and, but not B, C, or, you know, they had this fourth grade teacher that just wrecked them. There's usually like a really deep, painful story in mathematics. And the reason I want to bring and talk about those stories right now, just to think about math in that context is if we're talking about the words that Andrew was talking about, speaking truth to power. I don't know of any group of people more powerful in the world today than those in the mathematicians or the scientists. You know, you've heard of things like, hey, that's truth, man, but, but that's scientific truth. Have you ever heard people say that thing? As if like scientific truth is like the greater truth, as if like, oh my gosh, you're just an artist. Well, sucks to be you because I'm a scientist and scientific truth is much better than any truth you can think of. It's just this hammer we have that can just knock down any argument we want to. So what does it mean to talk about scientific truth? And you know, the coolest scientist there is to me is a mathematician, because we just think in the most abstract and the most cleanest things. We don't have repeatable data. Like I don't need to repeat data to find out what a triangle looks like. I know the sum of the angles of a triangle are 180 degrees for any triangle in the existence and that can ever exist. I don't need to experiment on it. So when mathematicians talk about truth, we talk about truth with a capital T. So that comes with some issues of power behind it. And so what do we as students and as professors who are dealing with a whole bunch of different classes that you guys are going to begin your adventures? My colleagues talked about this liberal arts. That just to me is a spectrum of things you can take. You can have pizza to corn dogs to ice cream to chocolate. I mean, this is like all of these cool classes, right? And one class, you know, are going to be some math classes or some classes in the sciences. And then there are going to be classes in the arts and the humanities and poli sci and business to engineering. You have this whole spectrum of them. So how do we look at this playing field of classes that we can take? And what does that have to do with our major, all of these bigger issues? I just want to kind of lift the hood up just a little bit to talk about that from a math professor's perspective. You know, I grew up in India. I was born and raised in India. And let me show you this picture. Um, gosh, it's been so long since I actually did Zoom. Uh, let me share with you this picture of, let's see if you can see. Can you all see this, my friends? This little line in the bottom. Having grown up in India, this is the notion of who is cool and who isn't from an Indian parent's perspective. So my parents got together with all the other parents and when we were uh, um, you know, in high school, this is the kind of stuff we talk about. The people on the right side here are the coolest kids in the world from our parents' perspective. And as you move down this list, life gets worse for you. And let me tell you what this means, right? So in India, college is free, right? To go to college is free because it's a socialistic country. 
which means that in order for you to pick what major you're going to be at in college, the test you take at the end of high school, the better you do on the test, the first round draft pick you get to pick your major in college. So it's like the SAT, ACT kind of a thing, except it's like a killer test that includes like all four years of high school packed together. So first kids who just rock it, get to pick their major, you know, all they pick, they all pick like math and engineering. The next set of kids pick the sciences and the next group of kids pick like, you know, econ and poli sci and history. And you kind of like go down this list. So my parents are talking to my friend's parents and you could just see this conversation, right? Like, uh, Hey man, how's, um, how's Danielle doing? Oh my gosh. She's amazing. What's she doing anyway? Oh, she's, um, She's a, she's a math major. Oh, good for her. You know, just, I just, she's so proud. We're just so proud of you, you know? And, oh, how's your kid doing? Oh, um, Andrea. Oh my gosh. Yeah. She's studying econ. Oh, oh, that's good. And you could totally see the GPA this kid got, right? Like just by saying the word econ. And it's like, and, and how's Andy doing? Oh, Andy. Yeah. He's an artist. It's like, oh, we'll pray for him tonight. Right. And this conversation just gets really quiet the moment they know their major. And the catch, my friends, to me, what I found really weird is that this is exactly what is happening today in the U.S. And to me, what I find that's kind of hidden behind the scenes is this picture that you see. So what I think is really happening is that there is something that's more complicated that's being asked by those in the arts and the humanities than there are in the sciences. So let me pause and just give you an example as, as to what I'm talking about, right? Like take a look at this fish. So here is what a mathematician is being asked. She's being asked to count the number of bones on this fish. The fish is dead, the skin has been taken off, and the bones of the fish are given to her on a plate. Hey, could you please count the number of bones on the fish? 384. Oh my gosh, you are brilliant, so accurate, so precise. This mathematician, she's amazing. Hey, could you, could you do that again? Yeah, 384. Repeatable data. Oh, glory. This is the greatest. You're the smartest person ever. And then a biologist is asked exactly the same question. Can you count the number of bones on the fish? Except the problem is the fish is alive and moving. You see, the question is the same, but you're being tweaked in a different way. You now have this moving fish. It's a far harder question because the framework has changed. The historian is also asked the same question, except now they're asked the question about the fish that lived five years ago. My friends, you need a whole different set of tools to try to figure out that question as a historian than you need as a mathematician. We deal with the simplest, cleanest, most beautiful things in the world today. You know what I know a lot about? Triangles. I'm really good at triangles. And that's it, right? Look, I know a little bit about squares and a little bit about pentagons. But like at the end of the day, we get to be really good at triangles. And we know so much about them. And we're so clear. But those in the sciences, namely biology, deal with the far harder question. Those in history, their questions are far more complicated. If you think about issues in the humanities and literature, right, their questions are through the roof. And an artist is thinking about what the fish might have been thinking about a week ago, like a deep question that something is so different than what a mathematician deals with. Okay, let me let me share with you another picture, right? And I'm going to ask you this question. Okay, so let me share with you this thing. Which of these two things are harder? So here's the here's this red line, and here's something on the left of the red line. All right, and this is actually a page from a book on my shelf on quantum mechanics, okay? So here's, here's the left of the red line. And here's the right of the red line. It's just a piece of a poem. Okay, I could just read, you know, read part of the poem, right? We have gone through with a glorious endeavor and been much favored in this fight. We aren't against the unknown. Nevertheless, if you could have seen the monster himself where he lay beaten, I would have been better pleased. Right? This is English words, better, glorious, maybe endeavor is a hard SAT word, I don't know. Plan, tight, grip, grapple, death. So you look at these things on the right side, you're like, uh, yeah, I got that. And on the left side, you're like, oh my gosh, all the anxiety and the nervousness I didn't want to see in front of this guy on this morning, it's there, right? You have like plus and minus signs, you have exponential functions, you have complex numbers, square roots. 
And y'all, let me, let me tell you something. The thing on the left, it'll take me, if you really want to know what that page is about, it'll take me a couple of hours, but I can tell you what it is. It's just a bunch of formulas that tell you about some motion and velocity in a vacuum, right? You could just, you could sit there and I'll tell you what those things mean. You could follow along, you could plug in some numbers and it's a formula for it. The right side, I don't know if anybody knows what the right side is. It'll be a lot of props if you do. It's my favorite poem of all time. If not, my favorite book of all time, it's Beowulf. You could spend your entire life trying to understand that poem and you could barely scratch its surface. It is worth your life to even begin that adventure. And I will tell you, the left side will take you a couple of hours and you'll get it. You know, do you have an equation for what it means to be a better friend? Do you have an equation for what it means to be you'd love your mom more or to love your spouse more, to love your friend more or which college to pick? Listen, none of those things have equations because they're complicated. Do you know what equation do you have to major in? Is it to optimization about the amount of money you want to make? I know a lot of people who are really rich who are absolutely miserable. Is that what you really want? Money? Is it happiness that you're looking for? Is it joy? Listen, those concepts of power, equity, forgiveness, gender, race, those are incredibly difficult things. There are no equations for that. But we have equations in physics and we have equations in math because you know why? Because that's easy. <laughs> that's actually quite easy to do. Um, let me show you this picture. Many of you might have seen this thing. This is the, one of the most recent images from the James Webb Space Telescope. I have talked about the James Webb Space Telescope for gosh, maybe 15 years of my life because it has to do with the origami unfolding and refolding. And that's what I study. The geometry of folding and unfolding is one of the things I care about. It's a gorgeous image, but it's still in a weird way is dealing with the simple things that mankind has done. The fact that we can put somebody on the moon, if you talk about Putting somebody on the moon, launching the James Webb Space Telescope versus solving issues of race and Black Lives Matter that we just talked about that Megan brought up a couple of years ago. Putting somebody on the moon is rocket science, but Black Lives Matter isn't rocket science. It is far, far harder than rocket science. That's why we can't figure it out. We can figure out poking our faces in the galaxy that's 3 billion light years away because it's sort of doable. It's a bunch of equations, which is a bunch of things and still people need to get together to figure out. I'm not trivializing it to a point, but to say that this is the greatest achievement that mankind has ever done, I don't find that amazing at all, right? To me, there's a lot more than this. So let me, and I, by the way, I'm not taking a please discover on your own opinion. I'm a mathematician, so I usually speak as if I know exactly what's going on. So this might be a different kind of a talk than the previous three lectures. Um, but let me just push ahead for something else that I actually find really difficult in my life, which is Tesla. I have an incredibly difficult time understanding Tesla. I drive the cheapest model stick shift that I can find because I love to drive with my entire body engaged, my hands, my two hands, my two feet. And I find Tesla, I can't even get in the door of a car because it's not designed for humans. You know, it's like slick and gorgeous, I get it. But my hands have like these things like called fingers that would like to hold things. And Tesla has this sheet of glass that you're supposed to touch, you know, as an iPad. I don't understand why that's not designed for my hands which have knobs and little buttons to pull. And so there's a whole issue of what Tesla is about their design ethic. But more importantly, to me, this little silly screen Tesla is a stand-in for something a lot greater, which is incredible technological power. And you know, the people who are feeding them incredible power, the person who is empowering Tesla are the mathematicians. We are the ones who are coming up with all the mathematical machinery and algorithmic logic to talk about everything that Megan and Christian and Casey are talking about, about issues of political change, about issues of empowerment for a person, about how the social media clicks and does these things and makes you choose for yourself. And the dangers are we are the drug dealers and you guys are the ones buying our drugs. And, and it's beautifully codified in the tech industry. So let me just give you a couple of you know, dangers of these things. I know you pointed out, but I wanna point it out from my perspective. And mathematicians and those in the sciences, we don't even know how dangerous some of these dangers are because the people who are designed in the world to keep the sciences in checks and balances are those in the arts and the humanities. And for the past 25 years, we have worked really hard to destroy the value of the arts and the humanities. So now science and tech basically reigns free. We can do whatever the hell we want as Elon Musk is sort of doing. So let me give you a couple of dangers. Uh, number one, the way data is acquired. 
right? Every time you click on the phone, which is an addictive drug that's been fed to you, now it is the, that data is theirs, right? It is an incredibly powerful thing. The algorithm that's used to predict what you like and don't like is biased. It's, I think Megan even mentioned this thing, the lens in which some of these people are talking about is through a certain cultural perspective as an anthropologist, he's seeing this thing. So in fact, you're taking biased data and plugging it back in to solve this problem, which is gonna give you trouble. There's a recent article, by the way, just to, just to make the rubber meet the road for y'all, about um, a technological algorithm for grading students. You know, instead of us professors sitting here, I'm looking at a bunch of faces like Evan and Sophia and Ava, like, hey, why am I wasting, listen, I got a lot of stuff to do. Why am I wasting my time doing the grading? Every professor hates to grade. Maybe there's like this like learning algorithm, right? Like this machine learning that kind of like does it for me. I just put in Katarina's like, you know, here's what she's done and like, just what's her final grade? I just don't even deal with it. You know what it does? It took kids who didn't do good on the first two exams and it just failed them. I just said, like, you know, this here's the prediction. If they got a B and a C, the, the chance of success, forget it, just fail the kid. And this one kid who got an A in the first says, well, that's a rock star. I mean, it is just an algorithmic bias rather than actually treating you as a human to see, you know what, they'll get it their fifth and seventh week before they actually finish the semester. They don't know what's going on in the beginning of class. But when the class ends, they're going to be, they're going to get it. And so instead of that, the algorithm actually crushes your soul. And it's doing that on a grading mechanism and it's doing that across the nation. The ecological cost, you know, when we talk about Tesla and uh, electrical batteries, we think it's like this magical machine that destroys all the evils of gasoline. And there is a lot of evils that come through uh, fossil fuels. But the problem is batteries get thrown away and there's these lithium cells. And it turns out lithium turns out to be the new hot currency in the world today. And a lot of lithium is in African nations. So basically half the world of massive powers are playing war games in Africa to try to control lithium markets with ravages that you don't see, they're all hidden from you. So this notion of things being free, like you buy an electric car and life is free for you, it's all hidden and massive ecological and social costs going on. This notion of human loneliness, a friend of mine is, um, um, he is the he was the director of student life and of um, well I guess he had a bigger title at that time which I don't want to talk about right now but at, at University of uh, Southern California USC and he was basically in charge of like thirty thousand students and their livelihoods of those students and he offered a course just like this course actually all right exactly like this course it's a free course uh, you get a unit right or something really you know like it's a pass fail. Uh, slam dunk. You don't have to, you know, just uh, kind of come and enjoy that uh, USC. And before uh, USC starts, they had 500 kids sign up within a day with an enrollment of five, like a wait list of another 500. And the title of the course is how to make a friend. And it turns out that students, and I'm actually talking to you now, <laughs> students don't know how to do it. And I'm, this is not just a USC thing. This is a national thing, international thing is all the speakers who spoke today, from Andrew to the three of us, you know, to the four of us here speaking as faculty, we all grew up in a time when we didn't have cell phones. So we were all idiots on the street where we learned to talk to one another. We sat together, had lunch together as friends. We got picked on in junior high. Every one of us got picked on in junior high, right? That's why we're professors, right? Because we struggled at that time, trust me. And so now we're here hanging out because even if you give us a cell phone and even if we do get addicted to it, which we all are in some sense, we remember the day when we didn't have it. Our roots go deep enough to know what it means to put that down to talk to somebody in the grocery line. And now the students, y'all, who I adore my heart breaks for, um, I have four kids, two graduated from college, one in college and one in junior high. And I could see that notion of technology and how it causes a sense of loneliness because of the dependency. And even the notion of AI and the dangers of AI, which we can get to in another time. All this to say to me is that the notion of power has been warped towards the sciences and towards those in tech being fueled by math. And I, more than any subject in the universe, adore math. I think it is the sexiest thing in the world, but there's incredible notions of power associated to it that I would love for all of you to keep in mind as you move ahead. I wanna quote one thing and say one last thing to, to finish up. This is Elizabeth Pruitt. She has a bakery called Tartine. It's in the Bay Area. There's uh, a branch here in San Diego. It's like $500 for a slice of bread. It's super expensive, but it is glorious. And here's her philosophy. She says, 
there can be as much collective knowledge in a loaf of bread as there is in a smartphone. By using our hands to prepare food for our family and friends, a cultural knowledge is transmitted that no technology can replicate. What she's saying is there's something far more powerful than the iPhone, right? There's something far more powerful, which is actually having a meal together, which is remembering your mom's pasta recipe or your dad's rice recipe or your grandma's you know, cannoli recipe, whatever it is, there's something about actually using our hands to transform the world. And, you know, my one small solution, let me offer a solution that I think is a solution about speaking truths to power is that to beat against these currents of power, it's not with more power. I, this is my personal viewpoint. I don't believe power beats power at all. I don't think we need to get this other person elected because that person's going to do this other thing. No, no, no. I think the way to beat people in power is to have food together is to really pick on 10 people who you're going to adore and fight for and love. I think this notion of world transformation is something beyond me to understand. This is just my call. But it is to bake something for your friends. It's to actually start a garden. It's to figure out what the earth is. You know, if we say we love the earth and love the environment, well, what does that mean? Like take a little piece of land and grow some basil or celery or, you know, pomegranates or something like that and try to till the world to see what that actually looks like to make it better. This is what I think it means to be more of a better human. And in the math department, I just want to close because this is one of my favorite things in the world, is we have actually a studio. This is my little baby. It's an 800 square foot studio of space in math to actually touch things. It has actually no technology in it. Well, actually, there's a plug that has beautiful sound systems so you can listen to John Coltrane while you're fooling around with stuff. But it's just like a craft supply room. So what does it mean to actually use your hands to be completely immersed and to play around with the ideas of mathematics? To me, these are the kind of things that I want you to struggle with at, U at, at USD is what it means to be more like human. And I think to take humanity more seriously would be to speak in truth to power more clearly. Thanks for your time. Uh, we really ran a gamut there um, and a lot to think about. And I, I think hopefully you can see now the, the real value in, in bringing all of these different points of view together. And I think uh, you just wrap that up very, very, uh, nicely, Dr. Devadas, th thinking about the importance of, of a, a more holistic understanding. And I think you're getting at the sort of narrowing that we've sort of narrowed our way of, of, of engaging with the world in, into a sort of very technological, um, you know, looking for answers um, without going through the complexity. You know, we want simple answers. And we often see that we, we have these complex problems in the world, lots of challenges. And how many times have you heard people say, well, there's gotta be an elegant solution. And, and that sounds really nice actually, but often what they mean is something simple and elegance often is complex. Usually it's very complex. Um, we, we want the shortcut when, when actually it takes a lot of deep thinking and, and looking at things from a, a variety of angles and perspectives. Well, I wanna make sure that we, uh, if you have any questions that you'd like to raise for, for any of our, of our um, professors today, or if you want to, you know, ask, invite them to engage with each other, I'd like to make space for that right now. Um, you should be able to uh, to just uh, raise your hand, but really, if you want to speak up, that's okay too, because I want to get everyone talking. Um, I don't know if you know how to do the virtual hand raise. I'm sure a lot of you, most of you, have used Zoom before, but I invite you now, uh, or to throw a question to the chat, whatever you'd like to do. We have a few minutes for some questions and discussion now. There yeah. is a, there is a question in the chat that I'm happy to answer real quick live. Um, so we're asking students to read two articles from two different news outlets, but they should be about the same topic. So the topic does not have to be related to objectivity or to journalism or to anything we've discussed but you might wanna use the information that we talked about today to help answer the questions about the topic that's in the news article. So for example, you might find two articles about you know, uh, an event that happened in your hometown. So in San Diego, if you've been around, we had this last weekend was Pride. So we have a lot of news outlets writing stories about the Pride Parade. So you might read two different news articles about that event from two different news sources. Great. And there was another question that was just sent to me. Is there a word count limit or requirement for this assignment? No. No. Okay. Unless anybody else wants to make one. 
but it's not expected to be a, a long, long paper where it's a response. You right. know, you might look at it like, you know, right, right. Which can we say a, a couple of few pages at the most? Correct. I would and say not one, even that long. One to, one to two pages would be plenty. Yeah. If you're going beyond that, you're doing, you're probably doing too much, right? We're not, we're not asking you to write a full paper here. It's a response, one or two pages. Um, I, I had more. a question, sorry to interrupt. Um, so let me get this straight. You don't want us to write about the two articles that you wanted us to read before the lecture. You want us to pick two articles? So there's, so the, the articles that were provided in the weekly readings those are informative. What we're asking you to do is to find two news items that are about the same topic and then use the information that we talked about today to help answer the questions that are posted in your weekly assignment. And I don't think that you'll need um, sources, right? You'll want to be clear about what articles you're, you're talking about, but are they, somebody asked about citation style. Uh, do you expect citations of sources? That's a good question. You, no, just, just reference what, are, what outlets you're using. Yeah, you don't need to do any academic research of any sort. You're looking at just two articles. In the popular good. press, yeah. In the popular press. All right, well, we've come to the end of our time now. Um, I will stay to answer any questions. If you, want to, if you have one, you can stay back and, and ask a question and make sure to sign up for a discussion section and to attend this week and, and make sure to engage as much as you can because that's where the value of this course really comes through. And I will see you all next Monday for our next set of exciting professors. Thanks so much, everyone. I'm really excited to meet you all and look forward to getting to know you better over the coming weeks.